When I was at school, I had no interest whatsoever in history. I was more interested in fiddling with wires, as I've said. I didn't really understand the importance of history when I was younger. But if you think about it, if you think about any person who has power today, such as a monarch or a prime minister or whoever, an oligarch, they get their power because of what has happened in history, whether that be this century, last century, or even in dark age British history. That determines who has power in conflicts that have gone on in the past. And if you start to unearth things that contradict the story that people have been told to get the, those people in power, they're not going to like that. Okay? And just to talk about briefly historians, most historians who work for universities, <clears throat> they have a curriculum and they'll teach the same thing every year. <clears throat> and they have students and they have papers to mark. And they will use library books written about history. Not many of them really go out into the field to try and find evidence of uh, previous history. And Alan Wilson and Baron Blackett, that's their bread and butter. They've been trying to unearth new histories since the late 1970s. Um, Alan Wilson on the right here, he was 80 this year. And Alan has a degree in economics and history. He also did two years of an archaeology degree, but he got called up for national service. And make use of Alan while he's here because he's got more knowledge about history than anyone that I know. He's a mind of information. And Baron Blackett on his left, who's his co-author, let's just say Baron's got a very unique mind. Okay, so the two of them together make a very good team. And they have made some incredible discoveries. I only became aware of them in 2010. And that's really because they've not been given a platform for their work because there's certain things that they have discovered that people don't really want out in the open. Now, um, the methods that they use uh, are they're fairly straightforward. So they use, they'll look, consult ancient maps to get place names. Um, they've dug up various artifacts. They use ancient poems uh, that often will give information, uh, ancient British documents. Uh, and they've written, um, they've written nine books so far. So the, the, they're all, the top three here, which we've got on display, these are all pertaining to their King Arthur research, their King Arthur work. The hardback, Artorius Rex discovered, that describes the discovery of Arthur II's um, burial site. And we're going to briefly touch on that. So in this talk today, I'm going to spend half of it just on their work and to explain to you why it's so important. And in the second half, I'm going to explain to you what's happened to them. Because if, you, if you're not aware of this story, I, I, I warn you, this is, it's going to shock you. Okay. Uh, their later books, um, the, the, uh, the Trojan War, talks about the Trojan War of 650 BC, uh, Moses and the Hieroglyphs. Alan actually has uh, worked out, Alan and Barham, um, how to decipher Etruscan and hieroglyphics. Uh, and th their final book, again, a controversial book, they claim they know where the Ark of the Covenant is. And I'm, I'm going to come on to that. But this is their bread and butter. If you go in their house, which I have done many, many times over the last year and a half, um, they've got these, these genealogy charts of British kings on their walls, huge charts that they've constructed using a whole uh, array of different documents. Um, <clears throat> now, and they, they basically, they, they've charted 80 British kings and, and worked out the genealogies for them from around, I think, 50 AD up to sort of 600 AD. And I don't think there's any other historian produced such detailed genealogy charts of the, of the various British kings in that period. Now, this is an eight-minute video uh, just to try and explain um, some of Alan's work. And, and we've got, I did a series uh, which was um, six hours of DVDs here. It's all been on TV. We're going to probably get these repeated. But this is just a snapshot. It's an eight-minute video just to introduce you to the sort of King Arthur, King Arthur research. Wilson and Blackett started in 1976 trying to find the truth about King Arthur. After 14 years of intensive research, they purchased a church which this research was suggesting was the likely burial site of the legendary king. They excavated that site in 1990 and an artifact was unearthed by a digger. This occurred when Wilson and Blackett were not at the site. The object is a solid electrum cross 
which could have only been made for an important or wealthy person. It has been dated to the period of Arthur, which is prior to 600 AD, and has an inscription which reads, For the soul of Arthur. What are the chances of finding that artefact by coincidence at the very site they claimed could be the King Arthur burial site? You get a line of princes, you get a son of Arthur I, Tathal, then Tythrin the subtle, Tythfalt or Theodosius, Tudrig, Theodric, Myrig, Morris, and then Myrig's son, Arthur II. And so you've got two Arthurs very clearly exhibited. These are not hidden. You'll find them clearly in the manuscript evidences that everybody else uses when they're writing about British history. Right. Here on a 1980 Ordnance Survey map, you've got the Monument of Milweir, this Monument of the Soldiers of the Military, on Mone de Gaia, Fortress Mountain. We're going there. Now, in 1983, a mere three years later, we've got an addition to the maps in the form of a motorway, but up on Mone de Gaia, here, right, do you focus in? We've lost the Monument of Milweir. So we've gained a motorway and we've lost the most ancient and precious of the monuments. Now this is the monument of the soldiers. This is it, here. This is it. And you can see the whole of the bloody kingdom from here. Just about. Now you can't see up the valleys, but you can see the whole bloody kingdom from this point. For Alan Wilson then, this site, taken together with other evidence, pointed to the location of Kaya Karadak here in Maganu. We began with two accounts from the ancient records of the secret burial of a king in a mummified form. We now have ten accounts, most of them from the 6th century AD, contemporary with the death of King Arthur. These accounts actually name the mummified king who was wrapped in a leather bag and brought to this river for burial in a secret cave. His name was Arthur and he's so named in the manuscripts. And what happens is that Sinultid is sitting at his cave and the ship arrives and there are eminent people in this boat that puts out from it and they've got the body of a dead man who was really some big guy. They bring it to Ulted, swear him to secrecy and he buries the corpse in the cave. Now the cave exists, it's still there. According to the Welsh genealogies, St. Ilted and King Arthur are first cousins. So we've got an account of a secret burial in Glamorgan at the very time that King Arthur, who's the only senior member of the royal clan who goes missing, is recorded as being concealed in his burial. The cave was actually sealed up until about, uh, I think it was 1886. A man from Cardiff went down there and he got a, a local quarryman and he put a little bit, teeny bits of dynamite in and they, they blew the opening out. Duck your head down. You have to keep down coming in, you know. Come on, duck down. Here is the grave pit. You can see the squared off ends, square that end, square right on there, very, very straight and square this side, and another square in that end. He was buried in the cave. Later, then, when they got the things ready, they took him out of the cave, put him in the church, you see? Right, which, you, which you at some point bought. You we bought had that. bought the church. Right. Church of Wales had let it go derelict, didn't want it. We said, you sell it to us? They said, yes. We said, okay, we'll buy it. Right. Of course, it's the oldest church in Europe. It's built in the year, sort of, 50 AD. 50 AD. Right. right. <laughs> we bought it. But they didn't know They didn't know that when you bought it off them. Well, that's uh, not for me to tell them, was it? <laughs> <laughs> they didn't want it. Yeah. So, okay, so you are... are so we now owned it, so we could root about quite free from any hindrance. Mm. And we did find a stone. And what did the stone say? It says, it says Rex Octorius Philly Mavericki, which was the... King Arthur? Uh, yeah, but... It's Electrum, which is 79% silver, I believe. Uh, yeah, so we took it to the largest and most reputable uh, company in this sort of business, who do all the work for the oil, oil companies and everybody else, and they've got all the assistance. Mm -hmm. Uh, systems there, and they have all the necessary tables and records yeah. uh, historically which show what the mix of uh, various impurities would be in yeah. certain eras. You follow me? Sure. And they've tested it for us. And what, tell us what the inscription on the front is. Well, it says, uh, uh, I've told us, and there's this, a man on a horse, you can pick him out in the middle. Oh, in the middle there. That's Arthur. Oh, on this, on this on cross this, here, that's, yeah. that's King Arthur. Yeah. Uh, the time is 6.16.
In common with most historians, the two men believe that Arthur was an authentic king of Britain who gave rise to the legends of Camelot, the sword and the stone, Guinevere and the Knights of the Round Table. Laurie Mayer reports. The apparent proof that King Arthur was man, not myth, is kept at the bottom of a garden in Cardiff. This ancient sword-shaped stone inscribed Rex Artorius, King Arthur, comes from what's claimed to be the legendary king's last resting place. The stone is said to have arrived by boat up the Oweni River near Bridge End 1400 years ago. In their lifelong quest for the real King Arthur, amateur historians Alan Wilson and Baron Blackett have put their interpretation on ancient manuscripts. An impeccably authentic manuscript of the year 822 tells of the body of a very important man with a stone being brought up this estuary. According to Wilson and Blackett, this is the very cave where the body was temporarily buried. They point to signs of a square-cut grave hewn by hand from the rock. They claim the local church provides evidence of Arthur's family links with the area. Burial stones they regard as vital clues in their historical detective work. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, the stone of Paul, son of Myrick, a brother of King Arthur. At Ogmore Castle, just down the road, they cite another stone actually naming a King Arthmail, which they translate as Arthur. Wilson and Blackett have now filled several volumes with their exhaustive fieldwork and research, a mass of evidence from so many sources that even academics find it hard to contradict. This bleak hillside, a thousand feet up, marks the end of their quest. In a church they describe as the Westminster Abbey of the Dark Ages. Wilson and Blackett claim it's cost them their homes, their jobs, and 100,000 pounds to find this spot and say with confidence that here lies King Arthur. Half Britain was waiting to see it on the 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock. They scrubbed it. Right. Well, on the 1 o'clock news, it was widely received. Phones were ringing all over the place. They went on at 6 o'clock news, mm -hmm. and a, a Half Britain must have been waiting at 9 o'clock and 10 o'clock, and they, they pulled it. And they showed a piece on Sarah Ferguson squeezing herself into a tiny little aeroplane to have driving flying lessons right. instead. There we go. Right. Yeah, we all want to see that. Oh, yeah. Um, what an edifying sight. Uh, Bob. Right, so I'm going to list some of their discoveries. And as I say, the, the books are here. And this is just the tip of the iceberg, really. Um, as I said, the genealogy of 80 British kings burial sites of King Arthur I and King Arthur II. They believe that Arthur I is buried in a place called Oldbury. They have carved stones associated with both of those burials. Um, the solid electrum cross that you saw there, which is believed to be King Arthur II's burial cross. Um, Alan has also located the legendary Camelot and several other ancient sites of that era. Um, Alan has also uh, linked the Colburn alphabet, which is an ancient British alphabet, uh, two uh, Middle Eastern alphabets, uh, such as Etruscan. And I think at, at this present time, I don't think there's anyone who can actually read it, Etruscan. Alan will tell you more about this, but he believes it's linked to the Colburn alphabet. And you can, that can be translated into Welsh and then English. Okay? But this is something that the academic establishment won't look at. It, uh, they've got their blinkers on with it. Um, now, some of their claims... They claim to know where the Ark of the Covenant is buried at a place called Unisabul in Wales. Now, for those who don't know, the Ark of the Covenant is the box which Moses built to house the Ten Commandments in around about 1400, 1350 BC. So Moses went up the mountain, supposedly Mount Sinai. He was given the Ten Commandments by God, um, which were carved on two tablets of stone. Um, an enclosure was then manufactured, which was a wooden box, gold-plated, and then uh, a solid gold box uh, after that, and then another wooden gold-plated box. This is the Art of the Covenant. Now, I don't think there's many academic historians dispute that that box exists, or existed, and it was in King Solomon's temple, I think, up until about 586 BC, at which point it was raided. And there's, there's various, and this is what the film Raiders of the Lost Ark is about, it's probably the most important religious and uh, historical artifact that there is. Uh, but nobody seems to know where it is. Now, there are several scholars who believe it came north after that time um, through, Alan believes, uh, Lemnos and ended up in the British Isles. Okay? 
and Wilson and Blackett claim to have traced it to a place in Wales, and we'll, we'll come, on, come, on, come on to that. Um, they also claim that there's a silver casket containing wood from the cross of Christ concealed in a cave in West Wales in a place called Nevin. And um, obviously I'm not presenting the evidence for this. It's all in their books. Um, they've claimed to have located the burial place of Empress Helen, which was a, who was a 4th century Empress Helen. Um, numerous other treasure sites around South Wales. This is an artist's impression of the Ark of the Covenant. Um, okay. I've got a little video here of Alan um, speaking a couple of years back about the Ark of the Covenant, because um, their evidence of it, of it um, coming from the, um, the Near East up to, to the UK, there's various documents that, they've, that they cite this is the, the Ark of the UK, but the, the placement of it in this particular mound, this hill in Wales, is very intriguing to me. Uh, it's all to do with, with the stars. I'll let Alan explain this in this next clip. All over South Wales, uh, Glamorgan Gwent, there are huge mounds, mainly on hilltops. Huge earth mounds, I mean really big earth mounds the size of this room. Some are small. And my colleague said to me one day, he said, uh, what's that one up there, you know? And I said, he, he said, a, a bloody, I said, a bloody head. Oh, I said, that's a ferocious warrior. And sometimes a penny drops, doesn't it, you know? The ancient Arabs, Hebrews, and Egyptians called the star constellation Hercules a ferocious warrior. And a penny was dropping them. Oh, boy. Because over to the other direction is Tumbalu, the he-goat, Capricorn. And over the other way, we had a mighty boat ship on the top of the hill. And that was spot on for the great constellation of Argo. Now, if you've got two or three stars, you can triangulate and find a pole star. Am I right? So we did, and it's a, it's a, it's a standing stone. And from there, we found all these big mounds, they're all named and located for stars, the major stars in the heavens. So you've got a star map on the ground. They go on about the Nazca drawings, don't they, in Peru. We've got something better and bigger. Just outside Cardiff on the, on the Garth Mountain, there's two big ones and one little one. <laughs> it's right for the belt of Orion. Down in August, there'll be a big one in the woods. And you can find the four outlying stars of Orion. You come across the way in Cardiff, houses built all around it. Taurus, big mound. Another one on the other side of Cardiff, on top of the hill. Aries are up. And you've got the Capricorn. And they're everywhere. And that's how you get after the Ark. All you've got to do is find Regulus, which is the biggest of the lot. Uh, you see, we said Regulus, because uh, Regulus star, is the star in, biggest star in Leo, the lion. And Leo the lion is the emblem of Judea and Jerusalem. So we thought there's a good chance that that's it. So it is suggested that the large earth mounds found all over South Wales were laid out by the ancients in a pattern to specifically represent first magnitude stars of various constellations. Wilson and Blackett have produced many star mound maps which confirms this theory. The mound which represents the star Regulus turns out to be at a place called Unus Abul. Just outside this village is a prominent hill or mound. According to Alan, the top section of this mound is man-made. Is this where the Ark of the Covenant is? Yes. In our, in our opinion, yes, yes, and I'll tell you why. It's a man-made mound, about four acres of it, 60 feet high, all man-made, on top of another hill. Someone in antiquity built a stone wall around the top. Right? There are four sumps on the north side, like big hollows in the ground. Okay. Uh, metal detection has been done on that hill, and I've interviewed the guy who did the metal detection, it's called Alan Hassel, and he explained to me exactly how he did it, and he's, he's told me, honest guy, that there's a four foot by two foot non-ferrous object so many feet below the surface. And there are sumps on the side of that hill that Alan has identified, which are to, to drain and keep the, the, the central chamber dry. And I've had negotiations with the farmers 
to try and get back on that land, have further testing done, and they just will not cooperate, which is another story. Um, so <clears throat> why could this research be dangerous? Um, now, the King Arthur research in particular, I'm just going to let Alan explain some of that. Well, Yeshnab oh. Gurgan dies, or was deposed in 1091. Mm -hmm. uh, he allegedly had 14 sons mm -hmm. and several daughters. Uh, the Welsh gentry, then sons of the lesser ones, all, as in England, kept their pedigrees and their genealogies. And I don't think the British public is generally aware of the huge mass of manuscript evidence that's available in this way. So uh, there are many people around today who can, and some of them do, claim their descent from Justin, Yestin. Mm -hmm. Actually, the last king was a descendant of his. Morgan was killed in 1300. Which, which goes back to Arthur II. And they all go back to Arthur II, who right. is, dies in uh, 579. Right. Arthur II is son of King Moirig or Morris. He is a sixth generation desec direct descendant of Arthur I, mm -hmm. who is Arthur who invaded Europe. Mm -hmm. His father is he's a son of Magnus Maximus by Magnus's first wife, Kindrek, mm -hmm. not his second wife. And, mm -hmm. and he is the only son of Crispus, noblest, bravius Caesar. So, uh, well, right. Crispus is the eldest son of Constantine the Great. He married, he's the son of Helen, mm -hmm. big British princess, and the emperor, Constantine Florus. Helen is direct descendant of the Holy Family. Right. So it starts to wobble about all over the place. Now, obviously, the Queen of England, having two parents, four grandparents, and then eight, sixteen, yeah. has got about uh, a putative half a million descendants, uh, yeah. uh, ancestors, sorry. So it's quite possible she could trace back into these lines anyway. But obviously, it's, uh, she's not, in the sense of Britishness, she's not a senior person. So it undermines it could who undermine. is the, the actual it could undermine it, yeah. Uh, yeah. true monarch. In the sense of descent from Brutus and the British kings, yes. Because um, Alan and Barham have had a litany of, of attempts to derail their efforts. And this, again, this is just the tip of an iceberg, what I'm going to list on the screen. Okay? Some of it is in the DVDs that I've made. There's three programs, three hour long programs which go into the smear attempts and the murder attempts against Alan Wilson and Baron Blackett. And I'm going to list some of them. They were framed for stealing jewellery in the 1980s. That, that went to trial and they got bad media press. And this was at the time when they were writing the King Arthur books. Um, there was a smear campaign instigated by historian Geoffrey Ash. There was a smear campaign, letters written to all media organisations claiming that Alan was a criminal which wasn't true. This is by someone called Ian McGregor, who was a straw man. Um, the, bo their bookshops uh, were visited by MI5, and they were told that they weren't allowed to, sto to stock them, or they were told to take them off the shelves. Um, Alan's house, when they were living in Cardiff, was raided by the police. They said they were looking for a casket. They tried to sue the police over this, and, and it, it, the trial was cancelled six times. They got bad media publicity for this. Um, the church that he mentioned that they bought, somebody vandalized that church and started digging up bodies and stuff. And it was reported in the media that it was Alan and Baron that had done this. So they got, they got the news articles saying that they were grave robbers. This all went in the press. It wasn't true. Um, they've exposed corruption in the Welsh, well, and in the Welsh Arts Council and in uh, an archaeological funding organization, um, which... Which, which tells you why they're not getting the funding, because these, these groups were corrupt. Um, they were framed for stealing paintings from a church. That went to trial. Alan Wilson nearly ended up in prison over it, and it was completely fabricated. Uh, they were framed. Uh, Barham was framed for a serious assault, which also went to trial. And on CCTV camera, he, he wasn't the person who perpetrated the assault. Um, they were driving along the motorway where they were going to one of these trials. A van pulled up in front of them. The doors opened and a jackhammer, that's one of these big pneumatic hammers that's used to dig the road, was thrown out in the front of the car when they were on the motorway traveling at high speed. The jackhammer went straight into the car. They could have easily died in that, in that incident. Um, they had an attack on um, a property that they were staying in in Malaga that they believed that, that was possibly a murder attempt. Uh, they've also been poisoned. Okay. 
Uh, now, one of the less sinister things that's happened to them is that they had some brochures stolen. And I'm going to let Alan explain what happened to them in the 1980s when they were trying to promote the King Arthur. Because what they did, they started a business trying to get bus trips and bus tours to come and see the grave of King Arthur. And they were trying to promote that and sell it to the travel industry. You want to promote this work and the history and get people visiting. That's right. So you've got to go to the biggest exhibition and in the UK, our, in London. It's great with coaches, we'll take them round. Right. And we'll take them round in the coaches. We started coach trips going on. Right. Yeah. He applied for a, a grant, which is available uh, to anybody in, in Wales, uh, for brochures, uh, funding for brochures, right? Mm -hmm. He was told, yes, you can have the funding, but on no account must you mention the name King Arthur, and on no account must you mention the name of Wilson or Blackett. You delivered your brochures to the tourist board in Cardiff. Everybody did that. Right. They had a big stand, and there were tables, four chairs, and racks of uh, literature. Well, companies hire then that table, or maybe two tables, mm -hmm. and the set chairs as their little company patch mm -hmm. on the tourist board big stand, you see. Mm -hmm. They have a little dummy, well, they had a little dummy Welsh cottage in the middle, mm -hmm. and about 20 of these areas with tables. Well, we hired and, or rented one table with four chairs and some stamps on this. So you're trying to sell these tours to travel right. companies and maybe yeah. American market, that kind Whatever. of thing. Whatever. So yeah. we, we get along, we stayed in Bayswater for the night. We, we were up there early, half past eight, nine o'clock, we were at this place. Of course, the tourist board didn't want it to arrive from nine o'clock. They get there. The exhibition's open at ten. Mm -hmm. There's frantic activity everywhere. I don't know if you've ever seen an exhibition before. Oh, yes. yes. And all the bunting and bits of wood have been tossed oh, yeah, around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, right alongside were skips. Uh, nine o'clock, the open door. Everybody went in, got their literature out, except uh, ours. Ours wasn't there. Mm -hmm. Now, it had been loaded on the, the truck in Cardiff and sent on the night before, and so had everybody else's. They all got theirs, but ours was missing, not there. So uh, this is a bit like, you know, phone calls from Clayton back to Cardiff. You know, where is this stuff? Nobody knew. Well, it's on the manifest. It was sent to it. should be in Olympia. This is cardboard boxes full of brochures. Big, heavy boxes, four large boxes full of brochures. And, and we've got one of the brochures there. So I, I got, I was looking on, I could see this skip alongside, you know, and these trucks are coming away, taking the skips of rubbish away, ready for the opening. Huh? Mm -hmm. And this is pretty full. So I walked over to it. And uh, I could see, I was looking over my shoulder, I'm a bit streetwise, you know. And uh, I started throwing things out of the skip to see what happened. Mm -hmm. And there were faces glued to the windows of their little Welsh cottage office, you know. I, I'm on you. I got into the skip and I'm throwing the rubbish out. You know, I'm a nice new suit on, i got a brand new shirt and tie, I'm dressed to the nines. I'm inside the skip throwing the rubbish out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, of course, uh, the workmen came up, what the... Uh, uh, are you doing? <laughs> no. yeah, yeah. <laughs> People are gathering around a lunatic seat. And there, in the bottom of the skip, right. were four large, well-wrapped bundles of brochures. Mm -hmm. They'd escaped out of the tourist office at night and hidden themselves in the skip. <laughs> and they were trying to escape from Olympia. <laughs> so I, I called my colleagues over and we got these out, took them over to the stand. Uh, yeah, yeah, the bastards, you got it right. So now, out of the tourist ball office comes this large man, a big black beard, like a, and he comes over to Clayton Jones as if I'm not there, my colleague. He says, you get these two off this stand, no, I'll give you two minutes to get them off, and I'll throw them off. So, uh, I hang about, we've rented that space, we're directors of the company that's rented it. Pardon me, it's mm -hmm. ours. So he turns to stride back to the office, so I went after him, I said, hey, you, who? come here, you. I said, you want to throw me off, you try it right now. Mm -hmm. Of course, I'm younger then, I've got to pop him, you see. And he ran and shut himself in the office, he wouldn't come out. Right. So with that peace reign then, we just got our brochures in the racks and carried on. Around about the turn of the uh, millennium, I think it was, millennium, uh, Alan and Barham relocated in Newcastle. They live in Benmore. And in 2008, um, what, this, there's a block of flats which overlooks their property. And in 2008, three people moved into that block of flats uh, independently, who were all coincidentally from London. Uh, and they know that one of them is associated with the other one because uh, the wife of one of them 
moved in with the other one, and, and then he, ca he came and lived there four months later, and then she moved out uh, of that flat and then the other flat. So they know that there's an association between at least two of them. And they also know that one of them has claimed that he has been inside for, I think it's six years. Okay, and they, they suspect, although they don't know, that the other two might also have criminal records. Now, um, into, shortly after this, um, Alan and Barham have got a secured property. It's got its own grounds, and they've got two guard dogs. They've got a Rottweiler and a Belgian Shepherd. Now, I've been around to their house dozens of times, and I, I've never heard the dogs bark. Uh, they're guard dogs. They bark if there's a problem. Uh, and apparently, um, these neighbours were flashing strobe lights at the dogs, throwing food, trying to get the dogs to bark, and then they would complain to the local authority and the police. So it was as if they were trying to get rid of the dogs, and that actually went to court, and Alan was fined uh, for that. But Alan and Baron believe that th these three people have been sent uh, by someone specifically to intimidate them. And when you, when you add all of the other stuff into the equation, if you were to come out with that claim, most people would say, and don't be ridiculous, but when you add all of the other stuff in that's happened to them, it's not, it, it, it doesn't seem unlikely to me. Now, in, on the 14th of August 2011, just over a year ago, quarter past three in the morning, uh, Saturday evening, or Sunday morning, uh, um, Baram is in bed in his bedroom, Alan's in bed in his bedroom, and suddenly uh, Blackett was woken up by a noise underneath his bed. And his, very, very quickly, his bedroom became an inferno. He managed to stumble out, and Alan woke up in the other bedroom, went out under the hallway, and managed to pull Barham out of the bedroom. But the um, ambulance came, and Barham nearly died. He was in a coma for 10, 11 days. And uh, he was given a 25% chance of living by the doctors. Okay. <clears throat> now, this is photographs of the fire after the fire brigade had put it out. So the fire brigade put it out, uh, and then they left. Okay. As I say, Baron was in hospital. He was visited by a priest. Uh, and the word was that he was probably going to die. Now... Again, more photographs of the fire. And he had tubes. I just took this photograph the other day. He had tubes put down his throat to clear all of the smoke out of his lungs. Now, about after he came out of hospital and they started tidying up the mess from the room, they realized there was these, the rafter underneath the floorboards had this curious chunk, semicircular chunk missing out of it. And Barham actually has... He claims that he has in the past seen an incendiary device operate, and he's convinced that somebody put an incendiary device under his bed and triggered it deliberately at quarter past three in the morning to start that fire. Because he doesn't smoke, there was no candles on, it was the middle of summer, so there was no heating on. And the electrics all worked after the fire, so it was not an electrical fault that's removed a huge chunk from this floorboard. That's it there. Okay. Now, when the fire brigade had put the fire out, the area there where this debris is, the fire brigade didn't see that damage because it was covered with debris at the time. The fire brigade haven't been back in the house since they put the fire out. Again, that's it there. Now, I'll just let Barham explain a little bit about what happened. So, it, it clearly looks as though something has either exploded or, um, you know, there's, there's an impact where that where that beam has been damaged. It's not, it's not just fire damage. You can see that it's, it, that it's possibly something. It is something. combustion, a bomb. It started with the explosion, and then it was followed by uh, the um, fast and furious inferno of fire. And that's exactly what an incendiary okay. device does. I've seen an incendiary yeah. device uh, in the 1990s by an MI5 operative who actually rented accommodation from us and an office. Yeah. So this, an incendiary device will extremely quickly turn a room into... As you describe it, an inferno. That's inferno, what, that's, that's what, is what happened. And he's the head of the Northumbria, one of the heads of the main fire investigation department. He said he wasn't smoking, we've got no answer to that. He says, our job is to stop fires and save lives. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a prerogative of the police if it's been suspected foul play. Mm -hmm. And that was the end of it. We've had, we have had electricians here, 
about architects here, about engineers here, and all see the same thing. I mean, this is serious stuff, Barn. This is an attempted murder, if you're right. It's attempted arson, murder, and conspiracy to murder. Right. Yeah, the incendiary defense, just please. You see this coming down here? Yeah. You can see the combustion. Yeah, so that, there's part of that floorboard. What I've kept is, I've kept the two key floorboards. Yeah. I'll get them out now, which were originally here. Okay, now, Alan and Barham at that time had a young man who was lodging with them. He was uh, living in a spare bedroom. Uh, and it's, they think that he may be involved, that, he, that he's either been duped, or uh, being paid possibly to put something under the bed which he may, th they claim that he was told that it was a, a recording device. So someone's duped him possibly to put that there. But he, he was the only person who had keys to the house, he's the only person who could have got past the dogs. Okay, now I'm just going to show you this video of a thermite flare because a, an explosives expert looked at that damage when he saw my TV show and he said he thought it might be a thermite flare. This is, this is a thermite flare going off. That's a thermite flare on top of a scanner, a computer scanner. So in seconds, uh, it can turn anything into an inferno using thermite. So we're not saying it's thermite, we don't know, but we're saying that it's been started possibly maliciously because of the, the fact that the damage is centered in one particular place. Now, the fire occurred on the 14th of August 2011. They became aware that it, that, that it might have been started maliciously round about the beginning of September. So Alan wrote to the police a big long letter explaining everything, explaining the damage um, and the fact that he thought it was a plot to murder. Um, the police did nothing. They didn't even come into the house to look at the damage. Um, Alan contacted me on the 17th of October. Um, and because the police hadn't come to the house, they hadn't in fact, the fire brigade hadn't come back to the house, they did come to the gate and they spoke to, I think, one of them over the gate, but they didn't come in the house. So I started recording these six TV programs just to try and uh, put out this information of this crime that the police were not investigating. My TV series where I actually did a program about this fire and the fact that we thought it was probably malicious. Um, that went out on the 27th of the 1st. And I sent copies of that to a chief inspector in Northumbria Police and I also sent it to a detective inspector. I deliberately sent it to two different officers so there's less chance of it being covered up. And I sent them a covering letter with that. Now, um, at the same time, these two letters crossed in the post. Alan received a letter from the Victim Care Bureau, or Alan and Barham received this letter, saying that their inquiries were complete and the case was dropped. And they hadn't even been in the house to look at the floor damage. Okay? So, um, I, I thought, well, they would respond to me because I've written my own letter with a DVD showing them all the damage. Uh, that's the letter there. Uh, now, neither myself nor Alan or Barham heard anything for a month after I'd written to them with my DVD, telling them that it was on television. So I started chasing the, the, chief, in, the chief inspector that I'd sent the evidence to, and he was avoiding me on the phone, definitely. I got the old, um, uh, I'll just go and see if he's, I would ring him up, ask for him by name, this is the chief inspector, Bruce Story he's called, and uh, you get the old, I'll just go and see if he's available, and the woman comes back to the phone, uh, who's speaking, please? It's Richard Hall. One moment, please. Oh, sorry, he's not here. So, and um, this, is, this is just a, when I was trying to get hold of this two, de well, a, a chief inspector and a detective inspector, they were definitely avoiding speaking to me. And I'll just show you a little bit of that phone call. Yeah. I believe you spoke to me a little while ago. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to get in touch with uh, Chief Inspector Bruce Story now. Right, I've spoken to, well... I've spoken to, well, I've spoken to, well, I've tried to get in contact with both Mr. Story and Mr. Coverwell and explain that you're trying to contact them. Uh -huh. They're both out of the office at the moment. Yeah, right. Okay, now eventually I kept chasing them and the uh, a, a detective inspector who covers their area where they live, he did ring me back 
and he had been given my letter and DVD, and this is that telephone call. Hello, Richard Hall speaking. I'm Sir Hall there. Uh, my name's Dave Culver. I'm Detective Inspector with uh, Northumbria Police. Hello there. And if I'd be trying to get in touch with me. Yes, um, I believe um, Terry McNamara passed some evidence on to you. Um, it was Bruce Story. Right. A number of weeks ago, passed on your letter. I apologise for not acknowledging okay. it. I've since passed it to a DS. I have uh, the letter and the DVD. Both Paul Makepeace and Nick Walker viewed the DVD. I haven't had the chance to do it yet in front of me here. Right. They viewed it. Uh, I understand from Paul uh, that the DVD clearly throws up a number of witnesses that we need to speak to. Mm -hmm. And that I've allocated, I believe I allocated that out, it was yesterday or the day before, to um, to Nick Walker. Okay. So he will, I've asked him to acknowledge your letter, so you should be getting that very soon. Okay. Um, and basically, we're, we're looking at the content of your report in conjunction with um, what we looked at the time in conjunction with the fire service. Right. Okay. Uh, right. I mean, they, they've... For example. It's my understanding that no officers actually been in the house to look at the, the, the crime well, scene. Well, I think there was a bit of a breakdown in communication right. between, I think, September and maybe November sort of okay. time. But before we can get the, you know, get that wheels back, put back on there and, and pick up on it again. But I assure you that Nick right. Walker will um, uh, he'll, he'll be dealing with it and hopefully he'll get some sort of response as soon as Right. Are you familiar with um, how incendiary devices operate at all? because you need someone who is, if they're going to investigate that crime scene. Well, yeah, you bear in mind what, we, what information we've already got from the fire service who are familiar with, with incendiary <coughs> devices and there's no mention of incendiary devices on their report. So um, I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll have a look at that and we'll speak to the fire brigade again. Um, I mean, if you look at the video, it's blatantly obvious that it's not a natural fire. It's, it's a bomb of some kind. Right, it's well, an incendiary right. device. I, I, I really don't know what I'm saying, but I, I know the fire brigade report certainly doesn't say that, and they would certainly, I would be very surprised if they, would, if they didn't pick up on something like that. I would right. be amazed well, in the I advise you watch the video. Right, I will do. I okay. promise that. I, I will be doing that. I know that, that I think that's Nick Walker has as well. So the video will be watched by me. So just to reiterate the fact that um, when the police, sorry, when the fire brigade put the fire out, it was debris over those floorboards and they have not been back to see that. So the fire report wouldn't have those images in it. So that phone call was on the 29th of February this year. Um, and as a result of that, me putting pressure on them, they sent two detectives on the 6th of March to interview Alan and Barham. They then heard nothing um, for three weeks after that. Um, yeah, so, so what happened then was, I was actually at Alan and Barham's house and we phoned them to say, what's going on? You've had three weeks. Uh, you haven't even, uh, you know, we haven't heard anything from you. You've interviewed us, but have you arrested this lodger? What's, what's going on? So the, the two detectives came to the house, and I was there. There was uh, Detective Sergeant Nick Walker and Detective Constable Harry Tuttle. Alan was stood there. Baron was sat in this seat, the guy who was in the coma for 10, 11 days. I was sat in a chair. And the two of them stood in the living room and they, they didn't want to sit down and they were explaining what, what's happened. Now this is a, an edited version of this conversation because we recorded this conversation. Okay? Um, and I, the, the quality's not great but you can pick it out and I've put subtitles on so you can read it. This is, they were here for 40 minutes. I've got a 40 minute conversation on tape. I've edited it down to about 6 minutes. Uh, I, I sense a slight change in your tone towards us as though you're not happy with something. Well, three That's weeks have gone by, three weeks and, and I haven't heard anything at all, basically. And what about the forensics? Are the forensics? Right. When we came down, I mentioned to you before, the time has passed since the actual incident to now, there is no forensics, because we cannot account for continuity. So if it wasn't at the time, that that's an opportunity that is lost. Well, yeah, but it couldn't have been done at the time. It couldn't have been done It couldn't have possibly been done at the time any of them because there were three full of debris. The fire service make an initial assessment because they are the experts. I'm not an expert in fire. They are the expert in fire investigation and whether they believe that something is suspicious or maybe a suspected militia ignition. And then they would make the decision as to whether or not the police would need to investigate that. And they supply us with... They didn't investigate. Well, if you have an issue with the police 
and wish to make a complaint against the police regards the initial investigation, you can do that in person to a police inspector and that will be investigated. Be inspector, well. quite specifically, that's the prerogative of the police if the police suspecting. All we do is put theirs on same lines. Yes. That's exactly what he said. He said, the no smoke, we've got no answer for that. There's no answer to it. It's not their issue. So but I am investigating it. Yeah. As a result of the program Mr. Hall put out, yeah. the concerns raised in that the police were investigated, the concerns that you raised, and I believe you've also written to your local MP. Yeah. So the point is that we can do forensics to touch for was an explosion. But all we need to know was explosion. Just all we need to know. We can do that. If you want to have some independent work yeah, we done, we will. You can do that, it's your property. I would have thought you'd, sh you'd surely need an explosives expert or someone who knows about the semi devices here and they examine that scene. Right. The problem being is there's a number of a period of time that's gone since the actual fire itself. So you have a problem of continuity over that period. The other part is that the fire service would indicate that they believe the ignition, the ignition was malicious. I brought a statement of someone saying he had candles in the room, and the fire officer say he had candles in the room. That was no candles in the room. And he's certainly not burning. But I have two people saying there were candles in your room. There's no candles burning. No, no, but where did it? 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 If it was thermite or something like that, a thermite flare, for example, there'll be traces of thermite in that wood right now. Uh, will. They will still be there. Look, You're telling me that if you investigate a murder, someone on the body's found we three years later, the We are not investigating a murder no. because no one has been murdered. Ten been murder. That's what we're you propose it to be. Yes. But from the evidence we've been given at the moment, that is not suggested. How do you account for part of the actual raft of them um, being blown away? You've seen the raft, there's a huge... <laughs> right, there's no way an actual if fire If you are that. saying that you believe an incendiary device caused a fire in your room, mm. you're yeah. perfectly entitled, if you do not agree with what I say, right. to get someone independent yeah. expert right. to look at it. A, 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 a guy, a bomb disposal expert, has watched my film, and he said right. he thought it was If he's going to put but pen to pen in your wish, if you wish to get him to put pen to paper, yeah. by all means do so. Right. Sure, I would have thought you'd want your own independent um, explosive expert just to have a look at that. Right. At the evidence. The evidence, from what I can see, and this is my opinion because I'm not an expert, is it's not an incendiary device. The opinion of the fire officers that I've spoken to, who are experts in their field, say it is not an incendiary device. So how can it how can it blow away part of the actual rafter that that piece right. of wood? with an egg shapes and all that. Well, you tell me why it did. If it's, what's, the difference well, I would, uh, what's the difference between an incendiary device causing that and a candle? You tell me. Absolutely. Because it, would take, it would take days for the candle. The candle couldn't do that. The, Absolutely. Not. The, the actual piece of wood would, no, would no, not no, have no. A, a huge chunk of it with the, no, no, the two. I would, uh, but I would. Why? The chunk is going. What you're saying is that have a fire. What you're saying to me. Okay, all right. What you're saying is that the evidence points strongly to the fact that there was... Uh, the Why does it... Because the damage is localised in that one location, right. and it was localised at four points on the walls. Right. Opposite. So, what's to say it wasn't uh, an electrical fault that's caused that then? Because well, because all the electrics were working. They yeah. worked after. All, I, I, put the, I put all the lights electrics, on, the lights the all worked after the fire. How can you say were working. you're not an expert, and neither am I? The fire brigade came here, and they didn't even come in the house. Spoke me in the air. The fire brigade, the fire, yeah, fire brigade, two of them. They came in and they said, we've got somewhere else to go. And they were like, they didn't even come in the, in the house. But they've obviously yeah. attended on the evening and put the fire out in the room, haven't they? That's a different well, that's that's a different kettle of fish. Would you, would you, if you present evidence... These guys have had two previous attempts on their lives, so you wouldn't look at that. In the context of where we are at this moment in no. time, I have been asked by these gentlemen to look at a 
investigate fire at this premises. The thing is, uh, uh, to, to be honest, it sounds to me like you're, 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 you're trying to find an excuse for this part, honestly, that's what it sounds like to me. First of all, I'm not your pal. I'm not your pal. Okay. Secondly, I'm impartial. I'm not trying to find an excuse I, I, for anything. Yeah. But if you believe there's a big conspiracy, you could also say I'm a member of the MI5, uh, and this is all a big conspiracy to, 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 to whitewash this. I would have thought, regardless of the length of time that's passed since the event, forensically, thermite traces would still be there. Yeah, but the police will not, the amount of money it would cost to do that, which ultimately would take you nowhere, we, we, we wouldn't do that. At the moment, we do not have evidence that a crime has been committed. Matt O'Neill has admitted from the three witnesses it was a listen device from the maid bed. Number two has admitted that it's been made bedroom to you, right? Number three, he was the only one with a full set of keys who can get past them dogs. What do you want him to do? Come and give you a confession. You would end up in that prince and put him sent in his own blood before you bloody arrest him. Now, the day after that conversation, they rang Alan and Barham up and said, we're going to send a forensics team round. Okay, and the forensics team came round on the 2nd of, eight, of April, and I was at the house when the two forensics guys, so the two initial detectives came around with two new guys, forensics. I was in the room next door, I didn't, I didn't go in and see them take the floorboards, but they took four of the floorboards that were above where the damage was, and they bagged them, they took them away, and Alan tells me that the, the main forensics guy, he was shaking his head as if to say, yes, there's something suspicious here. They wouldn't have took the evidence away uh, if they didn't think that, and they told Alan and Barham they were going to forensically test the uh, floorboards, the traces of explosives. Now, they then phoned up and they said, well, it's going to take six weeks. Now, I've checked this with the serving police officer and apparently that is the length of time it takes. There's a waiting list at the lab. It's typically a six-week turnaround time to have something like, like the tests done. So, 12 weeks went by and they had, had heard nothing, okay? So, Alan, or I think it was Barham, he rang them up to try and get a response. Eventually, they rang back and they were told they weren't going to test the floorboards because it would be too expensive. So, and I've also checked how much this kind of test would cost. You're talking about £100 per hour for the lab time. So it's going to cost under £1,000 easily for them to do those tests. And this is an attempted murder, and they're saying it's too expensive. I've discussed this with other police officers, and they cannot believe they're saying it's too expensive. So they said to Alan, you could come round and collect the floorboards. The police have said they're not going to test the floorboards. The police have said that Alan can collect the floorboards, which they took away for forensic examination, and are now saying, oh, it's too expensive. So... Yeah. Let's see what they said. Right, and what's that for? Well, I'm going to write a letter after this. Hello, I'm going to write a letter to your senior officer in this station. Right, it's um, Lee McManus. Lee McManus. Yeah. Well, he's not being first. You've got trouble with me, six for the... Excuse me, can I put it out? Did he win? Just uh, handing over of this evidence. Right, well, I hope I'll... Well, I think I'm asking me to fiddle with, so... Right. I'm going to ask you to delete that. Right. I'll turn it off, but I'll not delete it. No, I mean... Okay. Well, well these were not sewn up like this before. So that... They were in flags along the road. Yeah, they were in long planks. Yeah. Okay, so they, are they in different bags then, Alan? Yes. Okay, bags. so they've actually been sewn in half. Right, we've got them back, and they clearly they've actually been sewn in two or three. These three. boards were, what, three, four feet in length? Oh, four, five, five feet. Right. Now, I've run various um, forensics companies and I spoke to one guy and he said, oh, they're uh, nylon evidence bags and they're specifically for putting fire evidence in because they don't let materials um, seep through them kind of thing. And he said, what they normally do, he said, this, they come in standard sizes, which is why they cut the wood up. Um, and we can see that the wood was indeed cut. It lo looks like perhaps by a circular saw. Now, I don't think most police stations have got a circular saw in, the, in it. So I think they've probably been sent somewhere where they've been cut up. 
And he said, what they do is, when they do the forensic test, he says they double the, they double the bag over at the top and they tie string around it really tight and that creates an airtight seal. And that's what, that's what the bags, they've still got the bags, so they had this airtight seal. And he said, then what they do is, they cut a very small hole in the bottom corner and they put a probe in to test for the explosives. And I checked one of the bags and it had a little hole in the bottom corner. So we suspect they've tested these floorboards. We don't know that. We haven't got the ability to, we need a forensics team to check to see if a forensics team's been in. I mean, it's just getting ridiculous. So <coughs> um, we are seeking to have the tests done on the, well, the raft of that's remaining and the other evidence that's still there. Um, so in summary, somebody in Northumbria police has or is perverting the course of justice and should be arrested. It's as simple as that. The evidence I've presented here makes that blatantly obvious. Um, and really that's the end of the talk. That's where we are with it. And I'd like to throw it open to anyone who has got any ideas of what the bloody hell we do here. Because... You see, we don't know who is actually doing the obfuscation. We suspect someone in Northumbria police has taken their orders from MI5. 